right, everybody, please give a warm welcome to Assistant Professor David Cottrell. Thank you, Louis. Well, uh, so thanks for having me. Um, this is my first time at Manuel's Tavern, but uh, I've heard all about it. Um, sounds like a really interesting place. And I'm happy to be here. As Louis had mentioned, I, I study elections and representation. I'm an assistant professor in the School of Public and International Affairs at UGA. A lot of what I do generally has to do with data analysis and data science and sort of understanding politics by analyzing data. And in graduate school, I got very much interested in redistricting and um, some of these computer automated uh, redistricting algorithms um, that can be used to draw districts without partisan intent, but moreover be used to analyze the extent to which uh, districts have been drawn with political intent. So I'll, I'll talk a little bit about that uh, today. Uh, don't think I'll get too heavy into the algorithms, but I'll show you some results uh, for Georgia, for the state Senate, and for Congress. This is something I was working on in grad school with my dissertation, which is an algorithm that tries to draw really what's called compact districts. So uh, I was able to do that. That's Tennessee, but I was able to do that on a number of uh, states throughout the country in order to analyze the extent to which gerrymandering is being used to create or reduce partisan competition. Since then, algorithms have gotten a lot better, um, a little bit more sophisticated, um, and so we'll touch on some of that. I wasn't totally sure how deep we should get into the weeds of redistricting for this group here, but I just thought we'd start simple, which is uh, what is legislative redistricting? Most representatives uh, have constituents in a district that are defined by boundaries of a geographic territory, and uh, districting is the process of redrawing the boundaries of the territory uh, to alter the composition of the constituency. And this happens generally every 10 years uh, following the census because federal and state legislative boundaries have to be redrawn in order to be uh, equally populated. Not to mention some states will receive congressional districts or lose congressional districts, so districts have to be drawn to accommodate that as well. According to Westbury versus Sanders and Reynolds versus Sims, which are two Supreme Court cases, in the 60s that stated uh, congressional districts and state legislative districts have to be equally populated. So every time we get the census and a new count of where people are enumerated and we have enumerations of where people live, we can readjust the districts in order to uh, make sure that they're equally populated. So why is this important? Uh, there's a lot of reasons why this is important, but a big one is that in a democracy where we have democratic elections, redistricting can lead to anti-democratic outcomes. Uh, for example, one of the big ones is that when you have legislators drawing districts, you have representatives electing their voters rather than their voters electing the representatives. So that's a big one. Uh, the way you design districts can determine the outcome of uh, the composition of the legislature. A uh, minority uh, of the votes can be translated into a majority of the seats, and a majority of the votes can be translated into a, only a minority of the seats. Hence, you can get non-majoritarian outcomes. And one of the things that I'll show you today is that in Georgia, for example, Biden uh, received the most votes in Georgia. However, he does not win the most legislative districts. So if you were to um, aggregate his votes up um, in legislative districts, either Congress or the General Assembly, the, the Democrats uh, might and lose a majority of the seats. The other is that there's incumbency protection. Uh, this has been a huge criticism of, uh, of redistricting is that legislators can um, choose their constituency and therefore make it easier for themselves to be reelected. And some people I uh, think that this might uh, be the reason why we have such high re-election rates in the United States. So for example, in Congress in 2018, we had a re-election rate of 91%, and that's really common. It's above 90% almost every single year. The average margin of victory in 2018 was plus 30 points. And, uh, you know, there's about 30 of the 435 congressional districts in 2018 that we could classify as toss-ups as districts that we don't know really what is going to be the outcome. Um, and so there is a lack of partisan competition in the House, and so a lot of people think that that's because legislators are drawing themselves safe seats. And another uh, so problem of uh, legislative redistricting is 
minority vote dilution. The idea that um, so the majority in the legislature who draws the districts can suppress the votes of minorities by sinking those votes into districts where um, they're not able to have sufficient numbers to elect members of their choice, right? And so you, it leads to minority dilution. So these are a number of reasons why we would be concerned with legislative redistricting if you didn't know that before coming here. Okay, a little bit more as to why this is important. We'll go sort of through the logic. We can take a model, let's say a state has five districts. In order to have a majority of the districts, you need three out of the five. And let's say you just have a, a marginal percentage of the vote state was, say something like 51%. That party who wins just 51% of the vote, uh, wins just the, the majority by a small percentage of the vote, by a small margin, can redistribute those votes across the state. The, the districts so that each district is reflective of the state so that if you have 51% of the votes every district has 51% if every district has 51% of the votes then you have 100% of the seats right so for example in this case this is a case where if we said every um, every district has the same number of people it's represented by the length of the bar um, and the amount of votes that you have or support that you have in a two-party system where Democrats are blue and Republicans are red the number of votes is represented by the blue bar and the red bar, right? And so in this case, you need more than 50% to win a district. If you get more than 51% of it to win the district or the most votes in a two-party system, you get the entire seat. So just one more vote gets you 100% of the seat. And that's what's key in this system. In this case, we're going to translate 51% of the vote into five districts controlled by the Democrats, which is 100% of the seats. Right. You can also think of, so in this case, Democrats win the first district, the second district, the third district, the fourth district, the fifth district, because they have more votes than the Republicans. You can also take from those four districts where Democrats have a majority, pack those voters into one district, and then you now have a, a party who has 51% of the votes, it's the same number of votes, Right? But all those Democratic votes have been packed into one single district, right here, District 5, and taken from Districts 1, 2, 3, and 4. And therefore, in Districts 1, 2, 3, and 4, Democrats lose the majority, right? And only have the majority in a single district, and that is called packing. This is an example where if you're Democrats, with a majority of the, the votes, you can get 100% of the seats, or you can just get one out of five of the seats. Another thing that you could do is pack all Republican votes and have a very safe Republican district along with very safe Democratic districts. And that is how you create safe districts through gerrymandering. So the point of this is that depending on how you draw the districts, you can get very different outcomes, very different outcomes. And that is powerful if you control how the districts are drawn. So uh, because districting is so consequential, there is an obvious concern that legislators will intentionally draw districts to their advantage through gerrymandering. And so therefore, one of the things that we want to do is be able to detect gerrymandering when it occurs. And so this is part of what my research involves. And there's a lot of people at the moment that are doing stuff like this, but being able to detect uh, gerrymandering when it occurs and sort of understanding the effects of gerrymandering where it exists is an important thing because gerrymandering can be so consequential. But one of the biggest challenges, the major challenge um, in detecting gerrymandering and detecting the effects of gerrymandering which is just intentional, the intentional drawing of districts to advantage your party or yourself, is separating it or distinguishing it from the effects of geography. Sometimes doing that is really hard. So I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna explain how uh, the effects of uh, geography can be mistaken for the effects of gerrymandering and vice versa. Um, sometimes the distinction is obvious. And we could just point to Georgia. <laughs> so this is a map Georgia's congressional districts after uh, they had been redrawn in 1992. There's this famous district. It is called the Sherman District. And it's called the Sherman District because the district stretches from Atlanta all the way down to Savannah to um, capture voters who are both in Atlanta and as well as in Savannah. Now, this is a district that we would say is not very compact. Compact districts are just districts that contain people who live next to each other. It's sort of a, a neutral districting principle. It's a principle that we often use when we draw districts. It's something you should strive for to contain people who live next to each other. 
In this case, this is a district that violates that principle very much so, right? It contains people who live very, very far from each other. Oftentimes, when we measure the compactness of the district, we want to say that, oh, that district looks weird. One of the things that we do is we take this minimum bounding circle. It's a circle that just barely circumscribes the shape. Compare the average of that shape, the area of that shape, to the area of the district. And that gives us some measure of um, how misshapen it is, how strange a shape it is. But it, there's also something um, to point out here, which is really important, is that this district is really designed to combine black voters in the south of Atlanta with um, black voters in uh, Savannah to create one of Georgia's majority minority districts in order to give black voters an opportunity to elect a member of their choice. This was ultimately struck down because it was done in an egregious way and that you, you can create a district that does just about the same thing without having to be so intentional. And so this district, uh, this map was ultimately, ultimately struck, struck down by the courts. But the point is, is that sometimes you know, by just by looking at it, that the district had been drawn very intentionally. Georgia just, they didn't just stop in 1992. In 2002, is very well known for the, the gerrymandering that went on in Georgia. And, th and this is in part because Democrats sort of saw the writing on the wall. They were losing, they had majorities, they had this trifecta, so they had a governor, they had um, majorities in the upper and lower chambers the General Assembly, but they were losing it, and Georgia was turning red. And uh, knowing that that was the case, the Democrats egregiously changed the boundaries of their, their districts in order to have a, an advantage. Ultimately, it didn't work out for them. Uh, the state turned red, um, and so did the legislature and the governor. But this is uh, this is called, so this district here, this is the 13th district, is called the Dead Cat on the Expressway. But these are clearly non-compact districts. Um, and it gets even worse for the state senate and the state house. You can see these like little stringy districts here, right? Here's a district that almost ranges across the entire half of the state. And uh, one of the things that this map was known to do was to pin incumbents against each other. And in Georgia, you have to, in order to run for a seat in the legislature, you have to reside within your district. So one thing you can do is you can take two incumbents from the same party, put them into the same district, and then they have to run against each other because they live within that district. Otherwise, they gotta move, right? Sometimes, like in 1992 and in 2002, it's obvious. Right? Sometimes it's not. Here is the current Congress. These are districts that were designed by Republicans, and the the districts are not misshapen like you saw in 1992 and 2002. They're very different. And so maybe it's not obvious that this is gerrymandered, if it's gerrymandered at all. Was this designed in a way to give Republicans an advantage? Right. Was this designed in a way that gives incumbents an advantage? It's hard to tell just by looking at it. So one thing that might make you suspicious of a gerrymandered is by looking at the fact that in 2020, Biden won a majority of the votes, had a majority of the votes, right? And so, so therefore Democrats had a majority, a very small one, a minor majority, but a majority nonetheless, right? And, and one of the things that we like to look at is to what extent can uh, majorities translate that vote into a majority of the seats? And this is Congress, so there's 14 seats in Congress. If we align every single one, so essentially what I did was I took precincts and merged them with the congressional districts um, to get an aggregate vote share between Biden and Trump for every district, right? And so we can see whether or not Trump or Biden wins a particular district what share of the vote that Biden has in that district. And if we order those the districts from most Republican to most Democrat, right, we get this little distribution here, right? So these are all 14 seats. And in order to have a majority of the delegation, in order to have a majority of the delegation, you need to have eight of those seats. So you need to control these two in the middle. These two in the middle, which are those median districts, are uh, close to about 45% Biden 
in the two-party vote share. So that means that Trump beat Biden in those districts. Those are Republican districts. So in the state of Georgia, despite having a majority of the vote, they do not translate into a majority of the seats. Democrats, or at least Biden, only wins uh, six of the 14 seats. Part of that reason for that um, disproportionality is that these Democratic uh, districts here, right, are heavily Democratic, right? And so they're packed, all the votes get packed into these districts. You don't need 80%, 90% of the vote to win a district. You need just more, one vote more than the other guy. And so that means that these votes here are wasted, wasted Democratic votes, just like these votes here are wasted Republican votes. In this case, the districts are designed, or intentionally or unintentionally, the districts are designed in a way that the votes get wasted in these, uh, or the, the, the Democratic votes are more likely to be wasted than Republican votes. So that was that was the uh, that was our congressional delegation, right? Although it's interesting to talk about majorities in congressional delegation, it's meaningless because they ultimately go to Congress, and you know you need a majority in Congress itself to, to win. But in the Senate, you know majorities are important, and so we can do the same thing with all fifty six Senate seats, right? Just align them from most. Republican to most Democrat, right? Remember, most votes in this election went to Biden, right? To Democrat. But uh, Republicans control the two median seats, right? So they, despite having majority, the Democrats don't have enough um, of the distribution where it matters, right? And therefore, don't have a majority of the seats in the Senate. So the point is, is that sometimes the districts don't look t terribly misshapen, right? And there's this anti-majoritarianism that's going on that seems suspicious. But does that mean that it's gerrymandered per se? Does that mean that they have been intentionally designed that way? And the answer to that is not necessarily, um, because sometimes partisan geography creates that type of outcome. What do I mean by partisan geography? Well, we talked a little bit about how packing the packing of a party's votes into one district wastes those votes so that they can't be used elsewhere, gain majorities elsewhere. That packing can be done through the intentional design of the district, but that packing can also be done naturally, in part because we are so geographically polarized. Democrats and Republicans live in totally different places. Specifically, Democrats tend to live in dense urban areas, whereas Republicans tend to live along the periphery and in, urban, in, in rural areas. And what that does is it tends to cause these densely urban, highly democratic districts that um, uh, have a, an inefficient concentration of democratic votes. Whereas more lukewarm Republican districts uh, exist in the periphery and in the suburbs, right? So one of the big things about how Georgia flipped congressional districts was because those suburban districts went a little bit bluer. And so anyways, that is generally the Republican advantage due to uh, partisan geography. So that, that partisan advantage may not have anything to do with uh, intentional redistricting and everything to do with uh, the residential geography of partisans. And to be clear, this is just uh, this is just the geographic distribution of the Biden votes from 2020. Right? You can see uh, South Atlanta is all blue, North is all red. Right? That exists in every single major city in Atlanta. The clustering of persons. Uh, so to belabor this point, I'm clearly belaboring this point. The one thing I uh, like to point to in order to belabor this point is uh, Nancy Pelosi. I'm from California, in fact, just south of San Francisco. And this is a, sort of an example of you know this question of is it gerrymandering or is it geography? And uh, you might ask this question when you're when you're thinking about this incumbency advantage issue. When you're thinking about the lack of electoral competition. In Congress. Well, Nancy Pelosi has one of the safest seats in the country. Uh, it, it contains about 80% of San Francisco. She consistently wins with 80% plus of the vote. Um, and she's been reelected since 1987. So one might say, well, clearly the district has been designed to give Nancy Pelosi a, uh, an, an advantage. But 
if we take a look at the partisan geography of the area, of, you know, Bay Area, specifically San Francisco, Nancy Pelosi's 12th district is right on in the city of San Francisco. It's right there. And if we take a look at the Clinton vote share of all of the little precincts within the Bay Area, we'll notice that it is a heavily blue location. There's 7 million, over 7 million um, people living in nine Bay Area uh, counties. The nine Bay Area counties are 20% Trump, 25% Romney, 25% McCain. Republicans barely get a quarter of the votes in the nine Bay Area counties. A district, a congressional district, is only 700,000 people, right? So we've got 7 million people in the Bay Area. How do you draw a district that is going to be Republican, right? How do you draw a competitive district if you're doing this with respect to neutral uh, districting criteria? You just want to draw districts that put people who live next to each other in a district. You can't. The answer, the only way to get more lukewarm competitive districts is to extend the district way out into the valley, right? And pick up some of those Republican votes. Right? And that would be intentional. You'd have to do that intentionally. So I'd be really the point that it could possibly be geography and not uh, intentional redistricting. So um, given that we wanted to detect gerrymandering, the question becomes, uh, how do we distinguish between intentional gerrymandering and the effects of geography and other things or non-intentional factors? Um, and the answer is that we can compare the maps to ones that have not been gerrymandered and see if there's a difference. Right? So if you want to know, what is the effect of gerrymandering on this, uh, in this state? Well, we would have to look at the outcomes in that state and compare it to the outcomes of a counterfactual environment where no gerrymandering occurred. Um, the difference between the gerrymandered maps and the non-gerrymandered maps is the effect of gerrymandering. Right? That, that would be detecting Jerry. The problem is, is that we, one, nobody ever, it's hard to know whether or not there was intent in the redistricting process. And two, so we'll never see that counterfactual where there's a non-gerrymandered uh, district. So one of the things that we can do is we can have computers draw the districts in the same way that the legislators would, using the same neutral criteria, so non-political criteria, except the computers would do it without political intent. The reason that one, they're computers, and two, we would not give it any partisan or political data. And we just draw the districts in the same state with the same number of districts, uh, using the same residential patterns and partisans of geography, adhering to the same basic principles of, of districting, which is that they need to be equally populated. The districts need to be contiguous, meaning that if you are in one part of the district, you can get to any other part of the district without crossing a boundary. And they need to be compact, um, which is that contain people who live next to each other. So again, the difference between uh, the, the, map, the maps that we observe and these computer simulated non-gerrymandered maps can be attributed to political intent for the effect of gerrymandering. So there are a number of different ways to make computer simulations. These are just uh, the outcomes of ones that I produced just a couple days ago. <laughs> this is the actual congressional map, and here is a simulated version. This particular simulation has been drawn, you know, you're drawing uh, maps at random, and they're accounting for not just making sure that they're equally populated within some population threshold, not just that they're contiguous, not just that they're compact, um, but also that they uh, adhere to county boundaries, which is another uh, principle that um, districters or map makers try to adhere to. And you can see that they try to keep county boundaries intact, just like the actual districts. So uh, they're fairly similar, right? You have a computer, draw a thousand of those maps. Um, and I did that for uh, Congress. So this is uh, the congressional delegation for Georgia. Remember, there's 14 seats. And this is just a histogram of the outcomes of the districts. So again, there's a thousand simulated districting maps. I just looked at, uh, for each one of those 1,000 maps, how many of those districts uh, preferred Biden over Trump. Um, and just counted those the numbers up, plotted the distribution. So most of the simulations had about five Biden favored districts. The next was six favorite districts. So somewhere between five and six favorite districts, right? Five and six Biden districts out of 14. The actual maps had about six, suggesting that there's not a huge difference in terms of the outcome of the actual maps compared to a non-gerrymandered simulated map. 
right? Not a huge difference. But one thing to keep in mind is that most of the simulated maps, the non-gerrymandered maps, the partisan not conscious of any political data, produced fewer than a majority of the congressional districts. Remember, Biden won a majority of the votes. So that's sort of the important takeaway, is that uh, a map that has been designed blind to partisanship, blind to race, etc., produces um, non-majoritarian outcomes, in part because the geography of Democrats in Atlanta alone tend to pack those um, urban districts, right? Creating an inefficient distribution of Democratic votes. One of the things that we've noticed, especially now, uh, relative to any time period in the last like 50, 60 years is that the vote for president is almost identical to the vote for Congress. Um, there are some cases, the, the benefit of using presidential votes over congressional votes is that sometimes Congress people run out of post. So you want to know, well, what is the support for Democrats in that district? So you'd use uh, Democrats. Yeah, say... So you could use the total congressional votes. But again, because a number of Congress people run out unopposed, the thing you want to know is what do the districts do um, with a sum total vote statewide? In other words, how do they translate a statewide vote into seats? And there's other things with congressional races, like incumbency advantage, you have name recognition, all sorts of things that go into why a candidate might do well in the congressional election, um, despite being in a competitive uh, partisan district, right? And that's why it gives you a sense of the partisanship of the district. Now, not to mention, congressional votes and presidential votes are very much aligned. And lastly, this is the Georgia Senate. Again, this um, line marks the majority. This is the median. So you'd need 29 um, seats in order to have a majority. The simulations fall uh, well below the majority. So again, despite having a majority of the votes, the Democrats are gaining less than majority of the seats. And in this case, the actual districts are producing uh, even fewer, not that much fewer, but uh, a bit fewer Biden districts than the simulations produce, suggesting that there might be some gerrymandering going on, some intentional use of uh, districting to advantage uh, Republicans who are in control of the districts. But again, it's pretty close, and you do get randomly drawn districts that produce 25 Biden supporting districts. This is something that I published a little while ago, and essentially doing simulations, a little bit less sophisticated. These are not simulations that are accounting for county boundaries or anything like that, but designed to make really, really compact districts. And uh, did these for 41 states, for Congress, for US Congress, and uh, took the simulated outcomes and plotted them in gray, right, with um, these error bars that represent uh, essentially the range of the simulated outcomes, where you can see that um, the simulated this, the simulated maps create a large number of safe Republican districts, so around 130 safe Republican districts, and about 130 safe Democrat districts, with about an even number of marginal Republican and marginal Democratic districts. So it's highly symmetric, right? This is, again, the gray is the outcomes for the simulations. The red, these little red dots, are the outcomes for the actual enacted plans. And so you can see that in uh, the actual enacted maps across the country, there are far more safe Republican districts than the simulated counterfactuals, and far more safe Democratic districts than the simulated counterfactuals. Suggesting, and we see this when we break it down by who controls the districts. Places where Republicans have a trifecta, they have the governor, they have the, the upper and lower chamber in the state, and they're able to pass a map that they want, you see um, uh, Republicans creating safe Republican districts. You see the same thing uh, with Democrats as well. Yeah. So remember, these simulated districts have been drawn on a partisan geography where Democrats are clustered. That is the current partisan geography. So these simulations, these simulated districts are controlling for the effects of partisan geography. Does that make sense? So the difference between them is the effect of intent, not the effect of geography. And so what we're seeing here is that in the aggregate, you have the effect of intent across all the states is that there are fewer marginally democratic districts, right? Fewer marginally democratic districts um, and more safe Republican and safe democratic districts um, than, uh, than would exist if there wasn't gerrymandering. Maps were drawn by a computer.
essentially what you're seeing when you break it down is that Republicans are taking marginal districts and turning them into Repu uh, safe Republican districts. Democrats, in places where Democrats control the, the redistricting process, they don't, there's not a lot of marginal Republican districts. So what they're doing is they're taking safe, uh, they're taking marginal Democratic districts and making them more marginally, or more safe, right? And they're turning them into safe Democratic districts. And that's what you see going on. This is part of my research. Uh, it's a great time to be doing this <laughs> because it's a very uh, exciting time for map makers. And so what's nice about this is, again, we're concerned about gerrymandering. We should be concerned about gerrymandering for representative purposes. But in the past, it's been hard to detect because it's hard to know what the, the effect of intent in the registering process is. But with the advancements of um, computers, technology, with the advancements of data, the, the idea that we have this low-level data that we're working with, um, electronic, what they're called shape files. These are electronic versions of maps um, and we can do some uh, much more sophisticated analysis of the maps uh, than we ever were able to do in the past. And, and this technology doesn't just exist with a few people who want to gain an advantage, it also exists with you know, publics and watch groups and, um, and academics, I suppose, who can sort of analyze the districts uh, once they've been drawn. So thank you, Kevin. Thanks for having me.